my contact information. I'm Dr. Jennifer Aluzzi, and that's my phone number and my email address. You could also feel free to contact the other two people who are listed here, uh, Father Isaac Morales. Uh, he is the Associate Director of the CIV program and um, Mrs. Pamela Belcher, who's our Administrative Assistant. So their info is all right here on our webpage. Um, so just to give you a brief overview of CIV, um, I will say that as a, a professor at PC, and perhaps not surprisingly, because I'm directing the program, it's my favorite course to teach uh, that we offer at the college. Um, it is a fun experience for students and for professors because it's a team taught course. Um, your first three semesters at Providence College, you'll be taking a chronological overview. Um, starting in the ancient world and moving through the modern and contemporary period with a, a focus on the US and Europe, but in many cases bringing in um, the globe. For instance, uh, just last week in CIV, I taught on a man named France Fanon, who was born in the, on the island of Martinique um, and moved to Algeria uh, he became a psychologist and he became a fighter in the Algerian civil war in the 1950s. So you can't really talk about the US and Europe without talking about the rest of the globe. And that's certainly true of this course. So those first three semesters, you'll have a team of three professors. Your professors will come from the departments of history and classics, English, theology, or philosophy. So you'll get three of those four departments on your team. Um, and they'll take turns lecturing twice a week usually. Um, and those lectures will have 96 people in them, a give or take a few, that's what the cap is right now. Um, and those will be in a big lecture room and it is by far the biggest lecture you will attend at Providence College. Um, and then once a week, you'll meet in a small seminar group with one of those professors. And the seminar groups are generally 16 to 18 people. And in my personal opinion, this is where the learning happens. Um, this is a student-centered two-hour seminar where you're together with your colleagues, with your professor, and you're having an in-depth discuss discussion about a text that you have read uh, for that particular week. The lectures are designed to give you the kind of information and knowledge so that you can go into those discussions um, on your feet. <laughs> um, and so they help you in that way. And then in that, in that uh, discussion, you really get into the meat of a text and figure out what it's about and how it connects to your life and why it's important and why we're reading it, all those kinds of questions. The course is four credits. So that means it's taking up about four hours of instructional time for your whole week. Um, most classes that you'll take at Providence College are three credits. Um, science classes can be four credits because they have a lab, um, but most, most courses are three. So this is a bit more of a time commitment than most of the classes you'll take at PC. And that means the workload's gonna be a little bit heavier too. Um, but there's lots of resources available to you um, throughout your time at Providence College and, and throughout your time in the CIV program um, to help you figure out how to do CIV and how to, how to do the program. We have lots of wonderful writing tutors at our writing center. Um, who can help with your papers. Professors are always happy to have students in their office and chat with them about the texts and about their workload and about their papers. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, the fourth semester of the program is also a team taught course, but in that semester, you'll have two professors instead of three. It's also a four credit course, but this one is, it can be on anything and I'll show you, um, what we are offering this semester. It's called a colloquium this fourth semester. And um, Michael, can you see that now? Did it switch when I switched? Okay. <laughs> um, so um, this, the colloquium is designed by teams of two professors to delve into any topic that's really of interest to those two professors. And that brings together some of the themes and the ideas and the conversations you've been having over the first three semesters of CIV. So the range of topics is really huge. <laughs> um, but just to talk about a few, um, this one, the first one here, the Western way of war and peace is taught by two classics professors. And they're talking about 
how war has changed and, and, and developed over time and how we think about it differently now than we did in the ancient world. And of course, this is a huge and relevant topic right now, unfortunately, um, as we're watching this, this war happen in Russia and Ukraine. Um, and then faith and doubt. This is taught by a philosopher and a uh, Dominican friar who is in the political science department. And they're wrestling with these issues of what it means to have faith and what it means to doubt. Um, and then, you know, I'm just going through, there's widely different skin deep, living in your body and other space oddities. <laughs> That's a really interesting one. And it talks about our relationship with our bodies and what that means to be like people with bodies. Um, we've got uh, race and identity in contemporary America. Um, we've got the life and writings of C.S. Lewis, the history of sports, uh, the bricks and mortar of civilization from ancient merchants to Amazon's marketplace. And this is one that's taught by a, a, a professor of Chinese history and a marketing professor. So it's comparative and it's looking at how marketing has changed both throughout time and in different areas of the world. So you get a sense that this is a very wide range and, and students are often very excited about this fourth semester colloquium and being able to choose what, what works for them um, and what they're interested in in the fourth semester. Um, so that's kind of the general overview of the four semesters of the program. So four semesters, four credits a semester for a total of 16 credits. Um, and you can also find on our website some descriptions of other semesters of CIV. So you'll get an idea of what kinds of texts and ideas are being tackled in each semester of the course. So we have some from what you'd be taking 101 your first semester. So for instance, this group is reading the Epic of Gilgamesh, um, parts of the Bible, both the Old and New Testament, Sophocles, Homer, Aristotle, Plato, Livy, Virgil. These names might sound unfamiliar to you right now, but they won't after your first semester of Civ. You will be right at home with these folks and entering into conversations with them, which is a lot of fun to do. Um, so if you have a minute or you have questions about the program, I would send you to the website to take a look at, and it'll give you a really good sense of what folks are doing in the classroom and, and how they're thinking about this course. Um, the, other, the other thing I wanted to highlight for you is a new program we just started this year and we're all very excited about it. It's called Civ in London. And that is a program that will be open to you in the spring semester of your sophomore year. So it's kind of in place of the colloquium. The colloquium is offered in London by two professors, uh, along with other courses to fill out your course schedule for that semester. Many of those courses will transfer back for credits at PC. Um, so no worries there. It fits, usually fits very nicely with folks schedules um, throughout the four years. Um, and if you're interested in the program, they, they actually just came back from a week in Greece um, doing some connected work. So uh, again, bringing it all full circle, ancient Greece to London <laughs> um, in the trip. Um, it's very exciting. If you're interested, I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, there's also a blog. The students who are there right now are um, blogging about their experiences. Athens, this is older than Jesus. <laughs> Um, so a lot of fun posts. You can check out some of the cool pictures that they've been taking. That one's gorgeous. I hadn't seen that one. <laughs> um, and take a look at the, what the students are experiencing there in London. Um, so uh, you can also look at our website. We have some events um, as a program each semester. We just had a, a great uh, traveling uh, presentation of Medea, which is an ancient Greek play by Euripides and how it's been interpreted in the modern world. Um, but I think that's the, those are the main things that I wanted to mention to you. Um, you know, I think my favorite thing about this program is me learning from students. Every time, I teach this class, uh, even if I'm teaching the same text, I have a completely different experience. Because one of the things that I think is most interesting about this program and one of the opportunities that it really provides you with 
is to bring your whole selves into a classroom. And when we all bring our own experiences, our histories, our uh, the questions that drive us, what interests us, and we bring those around the seminar table, um, it changes the text, right? A text is only interpreted by those who read it. And we all bring our own perspectives to the text. And so every time I read a, a text, depending on the students in the room, the way I view that text changes too. Right? I think that's one of the exciting uh, things about this program is we have an opportunity to talk to one another, to get to know one another, and to really understand how reading and, and texts can, can shape us and have shaped us. The other thing I'd say about Civ is that after four semesters of Civ, I'd say there are two skills I'd like to emphasize that you come out of the program with. One, being able to read well. I know you all read well. You got here. You got admitted to Providence College. <laughs> You're all smart. I know that. Um, but I think in college, the way that you read changes, right? How you read and the experience of reading. Um, and what Civ helps you do is to read a text with a different angle and a different lens to apply it to your own life and make those arguments relevant for you. And the second skill I really wanna emphasize is writing. You will be writing in the program. You'll be working a lot on your writing and you'll be thinking a lot about how to make clear, precise, arguments supported by evidence. Again, I know you've all done this in high school and you wouldn't be here if you didn't know how to write well. Um, but again, in college, we're really working on those, honing those, those precision skills and uh, the quality of argumentation and getting your voice into your writing, which is really key for employers later on. Uh, they want to know that you can process quickly and express yourself well. And that is something that Civ is really good at doing. Um, I don't know if Michael, you wanted to add anything about your experience in Civ from a student perspective, and we can take some questions as well from students. Yeah, certainly. So um, I can echo uh, a lot of what you just said from a, from the student perspective, in the sense that you know, in in high school, obviously you do a lot of reading too um, in your classes, you know, English and history, but it was really in coming to PC and, and, and being part of the development of Western civilization program that you really do begin to read differently. You, you start to understand the certain conversations that you're going to have in the seminar. And I, that's a, a question that I, I think I want to ask you to expand upon a little bit is how, how the seminar dynamic works. Um, but you know, the types of questions that are going to be asked and the things that you're later going to be writing about, you hone in on topics that interest you. One of the things that I, I personally loved about Civ is that being an interdisciplinary course, being a history, philosophy, theology, literature, and classics course, is there are certain things that I read that really interest me. There are certain things I read that maybe didn't interest me as much. Um, but you really, you know, you learn a lot about yourself in reading these different texts. Um, I myself, uh, on, a, on a personal level, really identified a lot with the theology texts and the philosophy texts that we were reading. I remember right away, first semester, we read The Confessions by St. Augustine. Uh, and this is a book that, you know, I, I had never, you know, I, I grew up Catholic, but I had never read The Confessions by St. Augustine. And um, this is a book that over the years has inspired uh, many, many um, thinkers and, and people. Um, and it did the same for me. And, and you know, eventually through, through the Development of Western Civilization program, I ended up um, declaring a double major in theology because I wanted to read more of these texts and kind of wrestle with these questions that a lot of these authors were writing uh, about. So I, I think that's true for, for a lot of students. I think if you ask, you know, students, they'll give you the same perspective. Maybe some students identify really closely with the history text uh, that they're reading. Um, maybe some, you know, love when they go into the poetry um, and, 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 you know, what, what I thought too, is then when it came time to write my papers, I had a lot of freedom to kind of choose the topics that were most, uh, of interest to me and to be able to, um, kind of form, formulate my own ideas about those texts. So, um, but yeah, I, I would love to, there, there is one question that came in, uh, and certainly if, if anyone has questions, please, uh, send those through the Q and A, send those through the chat. But one question came in about, uh, is DWC a part of PC's core curriculum? Um, so maybe you could talk about that and, and maybe also how, you know, going 
going off of that, how PC fits into the curriculum, the core curriculum as a whole. Yes, um, that, so a couple things. Um, let me bring up another website for you all. Um, are you, you're looking at the core curriculum web yes. website? Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, so um, one thing I will say, and I'm, I'm partial on this, um, is um, one of the things I think is unique about a PC education is the ability in a classroom to struggle with faith. Um, I don't honestly think that happens in a lot of places, and it sounds like it happened in your PC classroom um, in the CIV program, and it doesn't make a difference if you, what faith you're from, or if you have no faith at all. Um, grappling with faith is a core part of this, and you may decide right at the end of it, this isn't for me but you've grappled with it. And so you can come at that from a place of knowledge and understanding. And I think that's a really rare opportunity that we have in, in fewer and fewer places. Um, and I'll come back to the seminar. I'll hold that question, but I wanna talk about the core here. Sure. Um, so the core, DWC is the core of the core. <laughs> um, it's often referred to that way, at least among you know, higher ups and muckety mucks. Um, <laughs> but uh, our core curriculum, as you can see in this handy chart um, on the on the, the screen, um, it's four courses that's part of your core curriculum. In addition to the Western Civ program at Providence College, you also need to take two philosophy courses. So one of them will be kind of a general philosophy course and one will be an ethics based course. You'll have to take two additional theology courses. So, uh, and those will be a 200 level and a 300 level theology course. So kind of an intro and a, and a higher level. Um, you have to take one course that qualifies as a fine arts course. And those are throughout the curriculum. Um, so if you sing, if you play an instrument, if you, uh, you know, wanna do ceramics or drawing or photography, there's a million different ways you can fulfill the fine arts. Um, you have to take one natural science course. And again, this spans several departments. We have lots of courses that are meant for non-STEM majors. Um, so they're designed for folks who are coming from outside the sciences um, to grapple with the sciences. Um, one quantitative reasoning class, that doesn't just mean math. Um, it can mean math, absolutely. Um, but for instance, in some majors, statistical analysis or um, uh, research methods can count as a quantitative course. So that depends on your major, how you'll fill that. Um, and then finally, a social science class. And again, those come from a variety of different um, disciplines across the college. Those are the core course requirements. And then we also have a set of proficiencies, i.e. these are the skills you're going to attain by the time you graduate Providence College. Civic engagement, writing intensive, you do a, a lower level writing intensive course and then a higher level course, usually within your major. Uh, a diversity course, so getting you to understand either race and ethnic relations within the United States or on a cross-cultural basis, um, or, and an oral communication course. Those proficiencies are almost always fulfilled within whatever major you end up selecting at Providence College. So, and some of those theology or philosophy or fine arts courses that you're required to take will also have proficiencies attached to them. So don't see the proficiencies as like additional courses in addition to the ones listed under the requirements. The proficiencies are usually things that you're going to be taking in your major anyway, or other within other required courses that you'll be taking. Um, CIV does not fill any proficiencies. Um, that's its own kind of separate uh, separately existing set of four courses. And doc, Dr. Lucy, sorry to cut you off, but um, just a follow-up question to that. I know that it's, it's a sort of common, um, I guess, concern or worry uh, for students when they see uh, the core requirements in front of them. They say, you know, if I want to study, you know, if I want to be a double major in accounting and finance, or um, if I want to, you know, double major in, in other things that are unrelated, you know, how am I going to fit all of this into my schedule? So could you touch a little bit upon that? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll start by saying that um, I, I have um, advised undeclared students for many, many years, and um, I've never had one not finish on time. 
<laughs> so it is eminently doable. Don't panic. Um, and the other thing I'd say is that I've had several advisees who have graduated with double majors and a minor. I did have a record student once who had a double major and a double minor. Um, and she was able to complete her degree on time in four years and she fulfilled all of her requirements and hit all the proficiencies. Um, so it helps to be thoughtful. Um, and that's a conversation that's really important to have with your advisor about your four year plan when you arrive here. You know, what is it that you want um, out of your college education? And, and what are some of the courses you might take at the beginning to figure out? what you're passionate about. Um, and then once you've decided on your major, it often becomes very easy to fulfill these, these requirements. Some majors will include some of these required courses. So for instance, if you were going to be a math major, obviously you wouldn't have to worry about a quantitative reasoning course, right? So um, I, again, I, I, um, I've never seen a student say, oh, I, I wasn't able to get my core courses done and I can't graduate on time. I've never had it happen to an advisee. Um, and so you plan um, and you'll get the courses done. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, and and I, I, I think just going back to um, the seminar uh, aspect, because I yes. know that that's you know, of, of interest to a lot of students. Can you explain sort of the dynamic of the seminar, perhaps how you run it and how you know other professors also run their seminars? Yes, actually, I've been observing a lot of seminars in the past few weeks from some faculty. So I've got lots of examples. I'll start with how I ran seminar last week. Um, we had read um, Audrey Lord, um, The Master's Tools and uh, Poetry is Not a Luxury and another essay um, um, by her. And we had also read some essays by James Baldwin. Um, both of these were mid 20th century American authors, essayists, um, poets. And uh, so the students had read um, a bunch of their essays and we had talked about their backgrounds in lecture. They came to seminar and we did a drawing exercise. So I had everybody sit down and, and draw their response to one of our key questions of the course. And one of our key questions of the course is, what assumptions is the author making about what it means to be human or what, what's, you know, what's reason? What does that mean? And, and are they critiquing it? Are they supporting it? Are they defining it? So I had them all draw their responses. Um, how do you think, and I had half the class do Audre Lorde and I had half the class do James Baldwin. How do you think this author, what assumptions are they making about what humans are, what reason is, and do it as a picture. And then I put them into groups and they shared their pictures and they made larger posters with one another. And then we hung the posters on the wall and students went around and they commented on the posters, asked questions about what was happening visually. And then we started our conversation about the posters. Um, and everyone explained what they were trying to present and represent and they answered questions and the conversation flowed from there. Um, so by the end of the two hours, we had an answer to our essential question about these assumptions these authors were making and how they saw reason and humanity. Um, and I had them go back and find some quotes to support their illustrations. And that's how we ran class. And the two hours flew by like nothing. <laughs> um, and then I was just in a seminar last week uh, with Dr. Mormon, who teaches uh, the first and the second semester of CIV. And she ha was having students analyze the arguments of Aquinas and she was also having them look for the underlying assumptions in Thomas Aquinas's and St. Thomas Aquinas, if you don't know who he is, you will if you decide to come here. <laughs> he is uh, probably the most famous Dominican friar ever. <laughs> um, and so people rely a lot on him. Uh, he wrote in the Middle Ages um, and he was kind of known for his logic and reasoning skills. Um, so she had them analyzing several arguments on the existence of God from Aquinas and figuring out what his assumptions were, uh, what his conclusions were, and having students challenge those. So they were working in small groups and kind of writing up their assumptions. And then she was having the groups rotate and add uh, information to other people's posters so that they would have a complete vision of, of how to break down one of Aquinas's arguments on the existence of God. Um, so those are two different ways of approaching seminars. Um, some seminars, oh, I saw another one that had a debate 
um, on the existence of God. It was also on Aquinas um, and half the class was defending the position of the existence of God using Aquinas' arguments. Um, and the other half was arguing against the existence of God, arguing against Aquinas' fundamental assumptions. And they were having a debate in class about that. Um, so that's something professors do often. I know another professor, um, Dr. Rick Berry, who often employs something called reacting to the past in his seminars, which are immersive um, role play games that are historically based and get students really engaged in the different issues and opinions that happened in a, in a particular time period. And some professors are just going to come in and they're going to ask you some questions. <laughs> um, and they're going to get you engaged in either writing exercise or small group work. And then you're going to talk about those questions as a larger group. So there's lots of different ways a seminar can be run. There's just so many different professors and different ideas. And that's part of the fun of it. You know, you're going to rotate professors and have different ones every semester. And they're all going to do things slightly differently. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I don't see any more questions from, um, from participants. Uh, if you do have questions, uh, any you know, la last minute questions, feel free. I, I want to ask one more, at least, that I think is, um, is helpful uh, in understanding, because I think it's something that sets Providence College apart, and this is something that our office talks about quite a bit, uh, as well as other community members, are the relationships that students are able to actually develop with their professors, um, with one another, obviously, but, you know, something that I always, you know, like to talk about is the fact that on top of the relationships you have with your peers, the relationships you have with your professors become some of the most important ones that you leave Providence College with. Um, in fact, Dr. Rick Berry, somebody you just mentioned is somebody who was um, profoundly impactful to, to my um, college experience. And so um, if you could just maybe touch upon, you know, maybe some of the uh, relationships that, that you have been able to maybe develop with students through the seminar, or perhaps, um, you know, as an advisor, or um, just kind of the, the, the way in which you actually get to know your students and they're not just kind of a number uh, on a page. And, and you know, when you see their name on a paper, uh, you know exactly who that person is. Uh, maybe you could touch upon that just a little bit. I'm, I'm trying to think where to start. I, <laughs> um, yeah, so I, um, I'm, I'm thinking this is a strange example, perhaps to start with, but over this, you know, horrible past couple of years with COVID and teaching online, um, I, I had I had a fantastic Civ seminar and they showed up to their Zoom room every day on time and they were ready to talk and I built some great relationships with those students. Um, I'm thinking of two in particular, um, Catalina and Sabina, but but they they have kept in touch um, since the class ended. And I remember what an experience it was to see them in person for the first time this year. We were all amazed at how tall slash short the other people were. Um, but for instance, you know, I um, I ran into Catalina at a, an event. She invited me to an event uh, that was held on campus last fall um, with with students from all different backgrounds, um, showing off their amazing musical skills. And I got to go to that on a Saturday, and it was just so inspiring. Um, Another student who I've had this whole year, um, Carrie, she just actually, uh, she became a history major. She was an undeclared advisee of mine, and she ended up declaring um, a double major in history and classics. Um, and she just presented at our conference over the weekend, our history department annual student conference. Um, and she also is deeply involved with theater at Providence College. And, and I learned this about her in her first semester um, as, as an undeclared advisee. And so I, I, I put her in touch with the theater folks and um, got her kind of welcomed into that vibrant circle at our campus. And uh, one of the first plays they did um, emerging from COVID, she invited me to come because they had a very limited audience, uh, but they still wanted to put on the play. And she was kind of working um, backstage um, and helping produce the play. And so I got to go and sit and there was just like, you know, 20 people in the audience and it was so much fun and it was such a good way to kind of emerge from the pandemic and go see live theater again. It was fantastic. Um, and, she, and I still have her in class this semester and she's also taken other classes from me. Um, I mean, I've written, you know, grad school recommendations for students I had in sophomore Civ who have kept in touch with me their, their, their four years at Providence College. Um, and then come back and say, you know, I'm applying to this grad program. Would you mind writing me a recommendation? So 
we really do um, build friendships and relationships with students um, through the Civ program, and you know, it's 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 a ton of fun, and I you know I really cherish the relationships I have with students as a result of the program. Thank you. Um, and one question did come in on whether or not there is a foreign language requirement uh, at Providence College. Well, there is not a foreign language requirement, but if you're my advisee, I will try to shove you to take a foreign language. So watch out. <laughs> <laughs> I personally think it's really important to immerse yourself in the culture and the language of another place, but it is not required at Providence College. So no one will force you to, unless you're my advisee. Just kidding. <laughs> yeah, and I, I will I will add that if you do study abroad in, in a country that's um, speaks a different language, there, there will typically be a requirement um, within those programs many times. Uh, for example, PC in Rome is uh, one of our you know, fundamental um, study abroad programs. And there is an Italian requirement while you're there, you have to take an Italian course. Um, but in terms of the core curriculum, uh, there is not one. Um, are, there, are there any other questions? I'll give it just a minute to see if any come in. Um, is that I wish I could see your faces, but I wonder if anyone's nervous about the Civ program or if you've heard rumors and I I can't even see your face. So you can just totally ask the question and I won't recognize you when you come up. <laughs> <laughs> we um it's a really anonymous space. <laughs> we we did get a question. Um we did get a question, is Civ part of DWC and what does Civ mean? I I that, that's on me. I should have clarified because I call it Civ and, and others call it DWC and uh, Development of Western It is all the same thing. Um, DWC, Development of Western Civilization, Civ for short. Uh, and it's kind of just a, a shortened, abbreviated term that, that students use. Um, but that is all the same thing. And we did have one student say, yes, I'm nervous about it. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I know a lot of students are. And the one thing, well, two pieces of advice I'd give you about the Civ program um, is go to your professor's office hours. Um, I know a lot of folks are really scared to go meet the professor and go to office hours and that it can seem intimidating. But for the most part, um, when you show up at their office hours, they're gonna be so happy to see you because we sit in office hours all the time and you know nobody comes. <laughs> um, and they're gonna be really happy to see you and they're gonna put your face to your name and you're gonna start building that relationship. And you'll know right away that like, it just makes the whole thing feel better and it will help your fears kind of tamp down a little bit. Um, the other thing I'd say is if you feel like the course is really hitting you hard, you're not alone. Um, it's not a surprise, right? If, if, if it seems like a challenging course because it is a challenging course. And again, like I mentioned before, um, a trip to the second floor of the library um, where you there are tutors available um, to help you with your papers, to help you with the course. Um, they can, that's what they're there for. So never, never hesitate to, to take a trip to the writing center uh, to get a tutor, a civ tutor. Um, it, it can help you immensely and help your confidence in the program. And that's why we have those folks, right? Is, is, is for you all. Um, and so those are the two pieces of advice I'd say, right? Like, don't be shy about um, showing up to a writing tutor or a civ tutor, and don't be shy about talking to your professor and letting them know what you're thinking because we can't always know what's going on in your minds. And if you're struggling with something and we don't know you're struggling, and we're just walking around oblivious, we can't know. But if you send an email and say, gosh, Dr. Aluzzi, you keep talking about the Bible and I don't even, I've never even opened a Bible before. Like you keep saying Exodus and I don't know what that is. I will answer that email. I will not make that mistake anymore. And we can sit down and chat about anything, right? I can, I'm happy to give you any background you need. So we can't always read your minds, but it's super helpful to build that relationship and, and people in the program will absolutely make sure you succeed once you get here. Yeah, thank you. And, and a couple more questions came in. Um, do you do students get to pick which civ courses they would like to take based on their interests? So one of the things that we're working on, as you saw before, um, are the course descriptions for each of the individual sections of civ. 
Um, and so you'll see some of them have descriptions, some don't. Um, but if there's a particular one you're interested in uh, coming in your first year, uh, you can let uh, me know um, and we can make sure that you get in that particular section. Um, however, what I will say is for your first semester, the registrar generally puts folks in a section of CIV just based on your schedule and your interests and your potential majors if you're coming in declared, right? So you'll be placed in a section. Um, Every semester after that, it is up to you and you get to register for the section. So you can take a look at the website, look at the descriptions. Um, and there's a special CIV registration day that happens before you register for all your other classes. Um, so that you can kind of, because CIV can be tricky with the scheduling because it's four credits, like I said, and most classes are three. Um, so you can kind of get the sieve you, you want, and then you can build the rest of your schedule around that sieve. So you register for sieve first. Um, so the only semester where you'll be like just put in one is that first semester, just because you're coming in, you're new. Um, but it's not like you can't move at all that first semester. You can move if you really, if that's really important to you. Uh, and all the other semesters, you're, you're, you're registering yourself. Mm -hmm. And do you have to apply for the Civ in London program? Yes, you do have to apply for the Civ in London program, and you will hear all about that. Um, if you choose to come to Providence College, you'll hear about it that first year. Um, I believe they'll, they'll start talking to you about it probably in fall, um, late fall. Um, and the applications, I believe, are due in early spring of your, of your first year at Providence College uh, for the, the sophomore year program. It's a nice option for folks who might be in majors that are very... Um, have like a lot of required courses that have to be done on campus. So the junior year abroad thing doesn't always, it seems like it might not be feasible. Civ in London is a great option for those folks who have kind of tight majors where they need to get a lot done. Um, it can be a really nice option there. And uh, another question is if DWC are different courses, what is the Civ program? Um, if we take a DWC course, does that mean we are in the Civ program? Yes. Um, so again, it's the different names here. But. Sorry, I know. I'm, <laughs> it's like second nature. That's one of those moments, right? <laughs> right. Make us aware. Yeah, this it's the DWC program is the same as the CIV program. We're just talking about it with two different nicknames. They're just two nicknames for the same thing. And yeah, everyone will be in the DWC program for their first four semesters at Providence College. Mm -hmm. And aside from that, we have a nice comment. My uncle graduated from PC over 30 years ago and he still talks about it, meaning, meaning DWC. In a good um, way? <laughs> hopefully, hopefully in a good way. Um, but it really is, you know, I guess to, to draw upon that, it really is that, that kind of thing that does unite Providence College alumni um, from, from all across years because uh, it's been a fundamental part of the Providence College education um, probably since the beginning. I don't, I don't well, for know 50 exactly. years. It is the 50th anniversary 50. of the program this year. So the same Incredible. year we showed up on campus is the same year the CIV program started. <laughs> <laughs> Incredible. Um, yeah, well, well so, so there you have it. So, I mean, for, for alumni, you know, it really is that kind of thing where um, if you say CIV, if you say DWC, any of the nicknames, uh, everyone's going to know what you're talking about. And it really is um, something that, that unites um unites everybody are there any other last minute questions it looks like um can you describe how much writing is required in the civ course how many papers are expected first semester that's a really good question so um it's required of the professors that we assign uh, four thousand words of formal and informal writing over the course of the semester that sounds like a lot it's actually not when you split it up over a whole semester of work um, especially if so for some professors you might be doing an informal writing assignment for seminar every week in fact i would say that most classes are doing some kind of brief seminar assignment that might be 300 or 400 words a week where you're kind of jotting down your thoughts on a text or having a reaction to the text um, and then most teams are going to have at least one more formal um, piece of academic argument-based writing. Um, some are going to have maybe a few shorter ones. Like I usually assign two to three page papers, a few of them throughout the course of the semester. But some folks prefer to have a longer research type paper that's due towards the end of the semester. Um, 
So it's going to vary from team to team on um, how you accomplish that writing, but 4,000 words for the whole semester is, that's about what people are, are shooting for. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Lucy, how many hours a week of studying outside of the lecture and the seminar do you recommend or would you say is common? So, I mean, the rule of thumb I usually go by, I think it's, I think this is like a federal rule or something, but for every credit hour in the classroom, you should be doing two to three hours outside the classroom of prep work. So for a four credit class, you should be expecting to spend like 10, 10 to 12 hours a week. And it depends, like some weeks you won't spend that, right? You'll, you'll spend three or four hours. Um, and on weeks where you're writing a paper, you might be spending more than that. But over the course of the semester, it's gonna average out to about 10 hours a week. Yeah. Are there, are there any other questions? Um, the the follow up to the uncle graduated over thirty years ago. Oh, talk about it. Talk, <laughs> talks about it in a great way. Good, I'm glad. Um, That's is, good to hear. Follow up. So. Um, that is good to hear. And um, and and to be honest, most of most of the alumni who I know um, speak about it in a positive way. Obviously, as you've mentioned, some difficult difficult aspects to it. Um, and some challenge, certainly, that's to be expected, but um, overall, uh, you know, very positive and, and really the experience um, to read text that you would in other places and to engage with text and really to engage with people, uh, I think, in the seminar um, in a way that you wouldn't uh, at uh, other institutions is a good way to kind of characterize this development of Western Civilization program. Um, Another question, uh, the courses are the programs. So the program would be the, the scope of the four semesters that you're taking it and you would take one civ course each of those semesters. Yep. Well, on that note, I want to thank Dr. Aluzi and um, just kind of echo what you said in the beginning, any questions, um, Going forward, uh, you know, email Dr. Luzzi. Obviously, civ related questions uh, specifically, email Dr. Luzzi. For any other questions that you have about Providence College, or if you have questions and you don't know who to contact for those, um, on our admission website or within your admission portal itself is probably the easiest way. Um, you have an admission counselor who is um, who is assigned to your territory, who um, is your point of contact. And so please reach out to any of us at any point too, um, even if it's you know not something you think an admission counselor is the right person to ask, we can connect you with the right people to ask. Um, we can connect you with current students, with current faculty, um, staff and other departments. Um, we are, our goal first and foremost, and we know that for you, this is a crucial time in making a decision as to where you want to attend. So we wanna make sure that uh, at the very at the very least, you have all of the information you need, all of your questions answered. Um, so on that note, thank you so much, Dr. Luzzi, and thank you all of you for for joining. Um, thank you for hosting, yeah. and, and please don't hesitate to reach out, folks. I really mean it. <laughs> I will answer. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, everybody. This was recorded, so this will be going um, on YouTube. So if uh, if you want to look back on it um, or, you know, let other people know that this happened and people who you think might want the information, please let them know as well. Um, aside from that, good night um, and go Friars. And we, uh, we hope to, we hope to, to see all of you uh, in the fall, if not sooner. <laughs> Absolutely. Good night, everyone. Take care, everybody. Good night.